Hi, this is Dinosaur George answering the questions you send to me through my website, dinosaurgeorge.com. If you have any question about anything to do with prehistoric life, feel free to drop me an email. Keep in mind I receive a huge number of these questions and I can only choose a few. And when you write, let me just tell you, it helps quite a bit if you, if you send me questions that are kind of direct. Um, honestly, if I open an email and it's two or three pages worth of questions, I just do not have the time to answer and read them all. I'm so sorry. And another suggestion is when you do write, don't ask me more than maybe two or three questions at a time. Sometimes I get emails and people will ask me like 15 bullet point questions. And again, my time is limited. I just, I'd love to answer them, but I just can't. So uh, anyway, there's your bit of advice. Let's get into it right off the bat. Uh, Mark from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Uh, Mark, let me tell you something. I absolutely love the Carnegie Museum. While we were filming Jurassic Fight Club, uh, a show that uh, was created for the History Channel, we got to travel to museums all over the country and I liked all of them, but the Carnegie was spectacular. You're very lucky to be living there and the people there were unbelievably nice. So if anybody wants to know of a good place to go see dinosaurs, my recommendation is you've got to make the Carnegie Museum one of your stops. Okay, so Mark wants to know, do I think Rowan Avis was capable of powered flight? Uh, the answer to that, Mark, is yes. Now let me tell you this, I've never had the opportunity to study a Rowan Avis skeleton. I've never had the chance to study it. So I base my opinion off of some early birds that I have studied. Uh, I've studied um, Ichthyornis, and I've studied, um, uh, what's his name? Confucius Ornus. I've studied Confucius Ornus and what I found is in Confucius Ornus he clearly has what I think was a wishbone and the wishbone is the thing that allows the sustained flight, the ability to keep flapping those wings up and down and sustain that for a long period and that's what causes you to lift off and fly. That's what modern birds have. Um, if you don't have a wishbone you're not going to fly. So uh, I believe Rowan Avis had that and if he did uh, then certainly I believe he was capable of actually flapping his wings and flying. Let me tell you this as well, they're making so many new discoveries of feathered dinosaurs that I think we may have dinosaurs that were capable of sustained flight. Not just crawling up in trees and jumping and spreading their wings and gliding. I think we may have had flying dinosaurs. We don't have any definitive proof of that yet, but I would not be surprised if one day somebody doesn't make a discovery that tells us, all right, look, this is a true flying dinosaur. Um, somebody asked me once, could dinosaurs fly? And I tell them, well, look outside your window. You'll see one fly by all the time. I think they're flying dinosaurs today. We just changed their terminology to bird. Uh, okay, um, Nadav, uh, a friend of mine from Tel Aviv, Israel, writes and says, when people talk about species of dinosaurs and other species too, I always hear they live from this point in time to this point in time. Species can't simply appear and disappear instantly. You're absolutely correct and this is a very, very good question. Um, you're right. Animals don't just appear and disappear. The problem that we have, Nadav, is that we're limited to the evidence available to us. And in a lot of cases, there are gaps of time completely missing from the fossil record. So let me give you an example, Allosaurus. You find Allosaurus skeletons and then you don't. And so the question is, well, what, did, did the first one just magically emerge one day and then they all died on the same day? No. The problem is that what happened preceding the time that the first one that we found, the, the one, what happened before that, we don't know. We don't know if, if they were living hundreds of years before it, thousands of years before it, or if there was another dinosaur that kind of morphed into it. And the same goes for when we find the last one. We look and we go, okay, there's none any deeper than this. This is the spot where we stop finding them. Well, that doesn't mean they all fell over dead one afternoon. It means that there's just missing. Uh, let me put it to you like this. Maybe this will make it a little clearer. Let's say that I give you a mystery novel, uh, a story about the murder of something. And I go in and I rip out chapters one through five 
and I rip out the last four chapters and I give you that book and I say, uh, Nadav, read this book and tell me who done it and tell me the story. Well, obviously you're going to say, look, I can only tell you from where the page starts and where it ended. I can only tell you what happened in between there. I don't know what happened before and I don't know what happened after. Well, that's exactly the problem we deal with, with a tremendous amount of prehistoric life. Because we're missing those chapters or those pages, we're left having to wonder. But some people don't explain it that way. Some people feel very comfortable telling you, uh, uh, you know, Tyrannosaurus Rex uh, died 65 million years ago. Well, okay, what if it was 64 and a half? Or what, what if it was 65 and a half? Or whether it was 69 or 28? Or who knows, you know? We, we have missing gaps, so we're left having to figure out uh, exactly what happened. So yeah, when you hear somebody say that something appeared and disappeared, keep in mind that's only because we don't have the whole thing. Crocodiles are a great example. Uh, we can go back with crocodiles and tell you almost everything you want to know about them, where they started, how they morphed, how they changed, how they evolved, how they ended up, and how they got to today. And sharks, we can also do that with them. But unfortunately, there's other animals out there we're just having to guess. Finally, uh, Hamza from Banks, Oregon. Hamza writes and says, what was the purpose of Stegosaurus's plates that lined its back? Uh, Hamza, you had to ask me a question dealing with a fossil that was huge. You couldn't ask me something about some tiny thing, right? <laughs> Look, this is the plate of an adult Stegosaurus. It's a big plate. Um, these plates are absolutely functional. They were made for something, not just for show. When I was a kid, I was taught that these plates were used as defensive weapons, but that is not what I believe anymore. I don't know if you can see this or not, but look at how thin, can you see how wafer thin this plate is? That's not a very good weapon. Let me tell you something. If you tried to defend yourself with that plate, it would be like trying to defend yourself with a potato chip. <laughs> Imagine being attacked by a lion and all you have to do is you have a bag of potato chips. <laughs> it's not a very good defensive weapon. So then what were they used for? Here's what I believe. When we look closely at the plate of a stegosaurus, we find a variety of ridges. You see these ridges that run all throughout this thing? We find a variety of these ridges and that suggests that they were covered with blood vessels. And if they're covered with blood vessels, that means that that dinosaur had the ability to probably plump, uh, pump, pump blood up into those plates. And the reason for that, I think, was twofold. Number one, if you pump the blood up there, and the plate was covered with a thin layer of keratin, the same stuff our fingernails are made of, if you pump that blood up into it, uh, it probably helped to change colors. Maybe they used it as a way to communicate emotion. But the most important thing I, th thing I think they did is it allowed them to lose excess body heat. They lived where it was very hot and very humid, and these are big animals. And as these animals' stomachs are filled with vegetation that's decomposing, that vegetation is gonna put off heat. They've got to lose that heat. They either panted, or uh, like a dog or a bird, or they lost that excess body heat to the plates. And in my opinion, that's probably what they did. Uh, and the other part of his question was, were there any dinosaurs that were omnivores? Yes, there were. Let me see if I've got one here somewhere. Yes. Um, this is the skull of an omnivore. This is the skull of an animal uh, called Struthiomimus. Uh, I believe Struthiomimus, Dromesteomimus, and Ceramimus, uh, or Nithomimus, those dinosaurs I think represent omnivores. I believe that they ate both plants and meat. I base that off of, you look at their hands, their hands have incredibly sharp claws, uh, which are perfect for grasping small things. And then you look at their mouth. They don't have teeth, but they still, uh, uh, had the ability to eat meat. I mean, there's animals alive today that don't have teeth that can eat meat. Um, you know, uh, snapping turtle, hawk, eagle, owl, my grandfather. None of those animals have teeth, but they can eat meat. So anyway, okay, forget the grandfather part. But anyway, so that's an example of a dinosaur I think was an omnivore. All right, listen, thank you guys so much for your questions. Go to the website, dinosaurgeorge.com. Sign up for our monthly newsletter. It's free. We don't share your email address with anybody, so it's confidential. Uh, scope out this whole site. There's a lot of cool stuff. Sign up to follow me on Twitter and sign up to be one of my friends on Facebook. Have a great day. Uh, thank you so very much, and uh, take care of yourself. And remember, for you young kids out there, you practice your reading and practice your manners. And if you get good at those two things, you're going to be successful. Thanks. We'll see you again soon.